right, we continue our study in Judges looking at uh, Gideon's son today. So last week we saw the, the end of Gideon's life. Uh, we saw uh, his life was, was quite um, unique, right? He started off really weak, really vulnerable, uh, needed God's help, God's strength. God raised them up. He delivered God's people from the, hands of, the hand of Midian. And then after that, we saw his kind of implosion last week. And we see uh, it ending, Gideon's story ending uh, with uh, God's people forgetting him. Like, white, kind of wiping out his legacy. He's no longer remembered uh, for the good or, 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 the, or the bad that he's done. He's kind of just forgotten. And we saw back in, uh, God didn't forget about him. He remembered him for his faith. We looked at Hebrews 11, and the, the point of the gospel is that we're no longer remembered for our sin. Uh, we're remembered uh, for our faith in, in Jesus Christ. And so today we look at a man named Abimelech. Um, and I'll just say this, this way. Uh, it's a really, this is a really difficult passage. Nothing good happens in, in, in the 57 verses we're going to go through. Nothing good. And so we got 57 verses. If you need a Bible, go and raise your hands. One of our ushers will bring you one. If you don't own one, this is our gift to you. What I'm going to go through, I, I honestly don't know how this is going to end. There's three different ways this could end. Um, and so we're going to just, I'm going to look at the shot clock in the back, and we're going to figure it out along the way uh, by God's grace. Uh, there are three ways I'm going to end it. I'm going to choose one of them. Um, and so what we're going to see with, with, with Abimelech is that he, I want us to see he is the son, to start off, he is the son of, of Gideon. That's where we're going to start. Uh, Judges chapter 9. We're gonna, Abimelech is both ambitious and treacherous. Now Abimelech, the son of Jerubbabel, that is Gideon. Uh, sometimes it tells us that's, it reminds us that's Gideon, but that's him. Gideon got renamed uh, when he contended against Baal, and he tore down the altar of Baal. He got renamed to this. This name literally means uh, uh, let Baal contend, so it's a mockery against all those who, who trust in the false god of Baal. And so that's his name. Um, and he went, to Shechem, um, he went to Shechem to his mother's relatives. Uh, what Gideon had, if we remember last week, he had a concubine from Shechem. He had, a, he had, a, uh, had 70 children, uh, many wives, one concubine. Abimelech is the, the son of the concubine at Shechem. It's important. So, she, uh, so Abimelech, the son of, of Gideon, goes to Shechem to his mother's relatives, and he says to them and to the whole clan of his mother's family, say in the ears of all the leaders of Shechem, which is better for you, that all 70 of the sons of Jerubbabel uh, rule over you, or one rule over you? Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. And so Abimelech here, he sees, uh, there's you know, great, great you know, disunity in the family when you have 70 uh, different uh, you know, sons, uh, not to mention uh, daughters, uh, and you have multiple wives. So there's a lot of family drama, obviously. And so he's going to leverage this family drama to, to wield power for himself. So he's going to the area and the region and the people of Shechem where his mother is from and saying, hey, look, you could have me or you can have the other 70. Why don't we just wipe out the, the whole clan of Gideon, all of his descendants, and then I'll be your leader. How about that? And he goes to his mother's relatives and he, and he says, hey, say this to the people, the leaders in Shechem, uh, so that he can stir up controversy and he can leverage that to gain uh, power. That's his objective here. Verse 3, and his, so his mother's relatives, they do that. They spoke words to all these uh, on behalf of, in the ears, uh, uh, on behalf of the leaders of Shechem, and their hearts in, were inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, he is our brother. And they gave him 70 pieces of silver out of the house of Baal Bareth. We saw this last week that, that they had made Baal Bareth their God. What that, that word literally means covenant with Baal. So the nation of Israel, God's people, have made a covenant with Baal. They've enshrined a false demon God as the God of their nation. And he, so I want you to think about this is a local demonic nonprofit. That's what this is. Uh, they have money there. And so he's going to go there and he gets, and they gave him 70 pieces of silver, which Abimelech used to hire worthless and reckless fellows who followed him. It's never a good thing when you're like taking, you know, the, the money to go hire worthless people. Like if you're ever going to hire people, don't hire worthless guys, like hire the good ones. He doesn't. He's a worthless man and he's going to hire worthless men. And they're reckless. And he went to his father's house at Ophrah and killed all his brothers, the sons of Jerubbabel, the 70 men and one, uh, with one, on one stone. But jo, uh, Jotham, uh, the, the youngest son of, of Jerubbabel, so that's Gideon, was left, and he, for he hid himself. 
And all the leaders of Shechem came together at Beth Milo, and they went and made Abimelech king by the oak of the pillar at Shechem. So, he's, so, so Abimelech, he's this he's an ambitious guy. He wants to be a leader. He's also treacherous, willing to kill anyone who gets in his way. And so not, he, not that the sons of Gideon, the other 70, are actually in his way, uh, but just in case they might get in his way, he, he goes and he hires these, these reckless, ruthless uh, uh, men who follow after him. He pays them. They become like mercenaries now in, in accomplices with him in the murderous act of killing his own family. He hires them with the demon money from the local, you know, a nonprofit, and uh, in order that he could become king, and his plan worked. Like they made him king. They made him king, and it's important for us to note notice here. Israel was not a monarchy. Like they didn't have a king. You, you will hear this throughout uh, the book of Judges that this was the day when Israel had no king. This was not a, a true God-appointed king. This was Abimelech putting him in the self of God. God was to be their king. He was to rule them. His word, his will, and his ways were to rule God's people. They, they, they were not ruled like every other nation. They were set apart. They were a different nation. God was their king. So what has happened is not only have they made Baal the God in which they worship, they've now made Abimelech the king who is now standing in the place of God and leading God's people, uh, and he's, he's, he's an evil guy. Um, and so the, he, they're not ruled by God's word, will, and ways anymore. They're ruled now by Abimelech. And I want you to think about this. He's a, he's a counterfeit king. He's not a real king. He's not a, he's not a true king. And so this was common in the ancient world that the kings, if you think about Egypt, for example, the Egyptian pharaoh saw himself as, as a god-type figure. Abimelech is taking this, this position. He's following not the ways of, of, of God's word, will, and way, but he's following suit according to the, the ways in which the nations, the pagan nations around, ruled themselves. And so this is where uh, zealous, ambitious uh, Abimelech finds himself. And it's very similar very similar to what's going on beyond the surface in his heart that what you see with Cain and Abel at the very beginning in Genesis chapter 4. Cain, one, uh, in, the, in Abel, Abel is, is a man uh, who, who God looks upon and says, he, he has faith in me and he worships me. Uh, and, and Cain is jealous of his brother. God tells him, hey, you need to rule over the sin in your heart. It's, it's crouching and wants to devour. You need to rule over the sin in your heart, lest it overtake you. Cain does not. The sin in his own heart overtakes him, and what happens? He kills his brother. This is exactly what's happening with Abimelech. And we need to understand like, our, our, our jealous ambition, um, it, it can be murderous without the hand of God in his intervention. Like if sin has its way, whatever, whatever it may be, it, it leads to the most horrendous things if it's not bridled, if it's not contained, if it's not ruled over. Abimelech does not rule over his jealous, selfish ambition. Neither did Cain, and it led both men to killing their brothers. There's one brother that escapes, though, uh, and this is a, a Jotham, and Gideon's youngest son. He continues, he's going to become now, a, uh, he's going to tell a prophetic fable. And when it was told to Jotham, he went and stood upon Mount Gerizim and cried out loud and said to them, listen to me, you leaders of Shechem, that God may listen to you. The tree, so this is the, par- or the fable parable he's going to give. The tree once went out to anoint a king over them. And, and, it, and they said to the olive tree, Reign over us. But the olive tree said to them, Shall I leave my abundance by which gods and men are honored to hold sway over trees? And the tree said to the, the, the tree said to the fig tree, You come reign over us. And the fig tree said to them, Shall I leave my sweetness and my good fruit and go hold sway over the trees? And the tree said to the vine, You come and reign over us. And the vine said, Shall I leave my wine and the cheers of God and men and go hold sway over the trees? And then the tree said to the bramble, You come and reign over us. And the bramble, a bramble is a thorny bush, shrub, or vine. Uh, and, he, and he said to the tree, if in good faith you are anointing me over king, then, then come and take refuge in my shade. If not, then let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. So real quick, before we continue, uh, th- this fable is depicting these honorable trees and dishonorable trees. Like, I don't know anything about trees. That's okay. 
There's honorable trees and there's dishonorable trees. The honorable trees are, are fruit-producing trees that are uh, blessing and benefit to others. This bramble is just think of it, this thorny bush that's uh, it's 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 not it's not it's the it's not honorable compared to these other trees. And so uh, he's giving this picture of uh, the, these trees uh, seeking out through the forest, uh, seeing who's going to be king, who's going to rule over them. If you if you haven't called on yet, it's similar to what uh, Abimelech's doing. Like they, they're looking for the people of Shechem, but this king. And so finally, the, the role of, of, of being a king is accepted by this dishonorable bram bush, you know, a thorny bush, right? And uh, the, the meaning is a, an indictment against the Shechemites. We're going to find that out. It's, it's the, this is an indictment against the Shechemites who have chosen the dishonorable king, the, the bramble, Abimelech. They made him their king. And so this is also, though, an indictment on Abimelech himself who uh, by the process of him becoming quote-unquote king, uh, he, he's used deception and treachery in order to gain this power. So the, the, it's about to get explained more in verse 16. Therefore, if you acted in good faith and integrity when you made Abimelech king, and if you dealt well with Jerubal, remember that's, that's Gideon and his house, and have done him and his deeds deserved, for my father fought for you. So Gideon fought for you. He, he risked his life to deliver you from the hand of Midian. And you have risen up against my father's house this day and have killed his 70 sons on one stone and have made Abimelech the son of his female servant king over the leaders of Shechem because he is your relative. If you have acted in good faith, which they have not, but he's saying if you did and integrity with uh, Jerubbaal in his house this day, then rejoice in Abimelech. Let him also rejoice in you. But if not... Let fire come out of Abimelech and devour the leaders of Shechem and Beth Milo. And let the fire come out of the leaders of Shechem and uh, from Beth Milo and devour Abimelech. So a double curse here. If you've, if you've led in good faith, if you've led in good faith, then we're good. But if, if, if y'all have done treachery, which we know they have, uh, then you should be concerned. May God curse you Shechemites and may God curse Abimelech. That's what he's saying. And Jotham, again, this is the son of Gideon, ran away and fled to Beer. He didn't go get a beer. He left to go to the city of Beer and live there because Abimelech, his brother. So that, that's where he's at. And I want us to notice three things here. Notice three things. One, I want us to see the importance of leadership. It's the importance of choosing a good leader. Did the Shechemites choose a good leader? No. They, they did not choose a good leader. They went to the, they, they, they allowed division, they allowed scandal, they allowed uh, 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 a bribery to overtake them and overcome them. And, it's, it's, and we see here with this prophetic fable that it's going to lead to their destruction. It, it's important for us to see that choosing, we must, uh, there's a great importance of choosing leaders. This fable shows us that it's important. And additionally, it says that this fable reminds us that the leader, the way the leader goes, so the nation goes, so the state goes, so the city goes, so the household goes. The way the leaders go, the people who follow, uh, they go. And so what we're, what, what's being told here is if you picked a good leader in good faith, then you should rejoice in that. They're good are your days. But if you picked a leader, uh, uh, and not in good faith, and a, and a poor leader, you should be concerned you should be concerned if you chose a leader out of selfish ambition and, and for your own purposes and you didn't honor what God honored, then uh, you should be concerned here. Secondly, we see the importance of honoring leaders. See, God is clear throughout the scriptures uh, of, of honoring leaders, but moreover, we see that God's people have not honored Gideon. And so it's clear here through this fable, there's this emphasis on honoring Gideon and his family and his household. He said, if y'all, if y'all honored him well, then you should, you should rejoice. But if not, you should be a little concerned. And why did they say, he, why does the parable say, or the fable say that they should honor Gideon? Because he fought for you, he says. He risked his life for you. And he delivered you from the hand of Midian. Despite all the evil and all the wickedness and, and all the failings of Gideon, we see here that Gideon was still to be honored for the things, the good that he has done. And I'll say this, and this will be a small side point. If you ever find any leader in any nation that you can't honor, you have zero honor for them. You must, you are blinded, your heart is hardened, and you need repentance. Because every single leader on the face of planet Earth has something 
redeemable, something honorable, something to look at and say, that is the image of God on display. They're image bearers of God. Not saying you have to vote for them, not saying you have to follow them, not saying you have to, to like them. What I'm saying is if you in your own hardness of heart have the inability to honor any leader, no matter who he or she is, you have no ability to honor, then you are like the, the, the Shechemites who could not honor Gideon and therefore traded uh, uh, leadership from, from, a, from a man who delivered them out of, of, of the hand of Midian to now following a man who's going to curse their nation. I just want us to see that. that's a side point. We can talk about that afterwards. The third thing here I want us to see in this particular portion is that there's a prophetic warning here in this fable about both the destruction of Abimelech and of Shechem, the leaders in Shechem. Abimelech is now is, is called what, uh, what is, uh, the, the, the scholars or, or theologians would call an anti-judge. He's not a good judge. All the judges in Israel up to this point have delivered God's people. Uh, he's not going to deliver them. Uh, he is going to be destroyed, and the people of Shechem are going to be destroyed, just like this fable has said. And every other time in the book of Judges, God uses a, a, a judge to bring about repentance in God's people. This is, like I said, th- this whole chapter, is not. there's nothing good that happens. There's no repentance. There's no remorse. There's no returning back to God. There's just uh, what we see is going to be called righteous retribution, which is about to be described. All we're going to see is retribution take place. If you remember last week, we looked at Gideon and we saw that uh, he had, towards the end of his life, um, vengeance in his own heart. We saw the destructive pattern of vengeance, how it played out. We also were reminded that vengeance is God's, not man's. So when we say the word, when we say uh, a righteous retribution, what this means is it's righteous, holy, it's God doing it. Retribution is the punishment inflicted on someone as vengeance. Retribution is God taking vengeance. Vengeance is mine, declaring the Lord. That this is, this is what we're seeing getting played out. So there's going to be righteous retribution done towards, we see as the, par- the fable has said, towards Abimelech and the men of Shechem for their evil deeds. Well, how does that play out? Let's look in verse 22. Let's look at Abim- Abimelech and an evil spirit. We're going to explain that because that bothers some people. Abimelech ruled over Israel three years. So he's already been leading for three years as this false, phony king. In verse 23, God sent an evil spirit. Who? God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the leaders of Shechem. Now I want you to see that this, this, this evil spirit, we're going to talk about in a moment, is, is, is sent uh, not to, to cause and stir up division between Abimelech and the leaders of Shechem. That's what it is. And the leaders of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech, just like Abimelech has dealt treacherously with Gideon's family. And th- that the violence done to the 70 sons of Jerubbabel might come up uh, uh, come and their blood be laid on Abimelech, their brother, who killed them on the, uh, and on the men of Shechem, who strengthened his hands to kill his brothers. And the leaders of Shechem put an ambush against him on, on the mountaintops, and they robbed all who passed by, uh, passed by along the way, and, and it was told to Abimelech. Before we get into what this evil spirit is, and, let's, and, and we, we talk about that for a moment, what I want us to see is why this is happening, how this is retribution. This is God's divine judgment. It, it says, he says, because the why is because the evil spirit was sent and the leaders of Shechem are going to deal treacherously with uh, Abimelech and there's going to be division there. Why? Number one, retribution uh, and judgment for killing the 70 sons of Gideon. It's clear. They, that, 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 it's clear why. Verse 24, the violence done to the 70 sons of, Gide- of Gideon's sons. That's why this, this is happening. Number two, it's also judgment on the Shechemites because they encouraged it. It said they, quote, strengthened his hand to do it. So not only the one who's done evil is about to be punished, but those who encouraged evil is also going to be done. I just want us to, that's just sober us for a moment. We are complicit when we, when, we, uh, when we do evil, but when we also celebrate, commend, or encourage evil. And so the chaos and the pandemonium that's about to break out is going to lead to both the downfall and the righteous judgment of God by God who is orchestrating all of these things behind the scene. That's what's at play here. That's what's at play. And now I want to point out that the, 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 what the text points out is that 
it mentions that God is involved, directly involved, right? It, it, it mentions God's direct involvement, that he sends the Spirit, right? What I want us to see here is that if you would have, if it would have left out the point that, of God's direct involvement, it just would not have mentioned it. You would have thought, well, this kind of sounds normal. Evil guy doing evil stuff, shady stuff is going to come back to bite him, right? Like, what goes around comes around. We'd all go, you know, I could see this whole thing falling apart, right? Well, you could see it naturally. You're going, this guy was evil. This guy was treacherous. Don't be surprised when someone's treacherous and evil back to you. Like, we would, we would read the whole story and go, yeah, this kind of seems like what, what goes around comes around. Uh, and we wouldn't be wrong because that, that we see that happen in real life and, and in, different, in, in different, you know, places and in literature and, and all, all throughout uh, our human, human existence, we see things like that play out. But it's clear that, that there's this indication that God has direct involvement in this to show the reader, to show God's people that God is, is, in, is acting in divine justice. This is a, div- this is a moment for God where uh, he, he is, he is, it's, it's playing out in real, term, real, real, real life and in real ways, in real circumstances. What looks like normal drama between two people and it's going to end to their destruction. What, we don't, what we're now seeing is that God is behind this, wielding his own judgment. The downfall of Abimelech and the downfall of the Shechemites is a, a judgment by God on them for their evil. So what is this evil spirit? Uh, it, 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 it's, uh, uh, the Bible is clear. The Bible is clear. And th- if this is news to you, uh, let me just encourage you to continue to read the whole Bible. And, and, and I'm going to uh, share some of the places where it is clear. But the Bible is clear that God sometimes uses evil agents, evil spirits, or evil circumstances to accomplish his will. The Bible is abundantly clear about that. I know that bothers some people, um, but we don't edit the news. We just proclaim the news. That's what it says. We don't need to make excuses for it. We just, or I'm just telling you that's what it says. We see this additionally later on with the uh, King Saul, who is the king, the king. We see an evil spirit. God sends an evil or, quote, harmful spirit to Saul to torment him. And it was a form of judgment because he turned against God. And we see that in 1 Samuel 15. We see that. And so this is not a, a, a... uh, uh, the issue of salvation. This is an ins- issue of God's divine judgment. God is judging him, judging Saul. Jo- God is judging Abimelech, and he's judging the Shechemites. Uh, furthermore, we see uh, th- uh, God, though God doesn't himself ever uh, create evil, um, nor does he do evil, he uses evil to accomplish his purposes. We see this in Babylon or in Jeremiah 29 when God's people are, are, are taken captive. They're taken captive by the Babylonians. We see in chapter 20 because of their disobedience. Then we see in t- chapter 29 of Jeremiah that they were, quote, sent into exile by God. See, God is actively working in the normal everyday life, wielding and working his plan. Furthermore, we see um, in, the, in the New Testament that there, the the, the evil, sinful people, uh, God uses evil, sinful people there too to crucify who? The Lord Jesus. The greatest evil act in human history was the crucifixion, the execution, the murder of Jesus. It also brought about the greatest good in humanity, right? The salvation of souls, the saved sinners. And so the way that played out, if you remember, it, it played out through an evil spirit entering a man named Judas. What did Judas do? He went and betrayed Jesus, sold him out for silver also. Uh, and uh, they handed him over and they crucified him. Acts 2, chapter, 20, or chapter 2, verse 23 says it this way. Uh, it, Jesus was handed over by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge with the help of wicked men. They put him to death by nailing him on a cross. God's using evil. He's, not, he, he's using evil to wield good which is exactly what we're told in, in Genesis 50 with, with Joseph, that what man intended for evil, God intended for good. So here, this, 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 this evil that is happening, God is wielding it for his own good and for good and for the good of his people. And so here the spirit, uh, the spirit is between um, uh, Abimelech and the Shechemites. And this is, uh, the, this is, like think of about a spirit of ill will towards one another. Like they dislike each other. There's disunity. There's harm between the parties. 
And in this way, God has brought, about, uh, brought himself in, into the conflict and in, 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 in causing division between these two sides. God did not make the evil spirit, but God used it to serve his purpose. And it's to cause the, the division and the, the corruption and the downfall of both Shechem and Abimelech. Which leads us to continual betrayal and a big old battle. Uh, verse 26. In Gaul, the son of Ebed uh, moved to Shechem with his relatives, and the leaders of Shechem put confidence in him. And he went out into the field and gathered the grapes from their vineyards and trod, uh, gathered grapes from their vineyards and trod them uh, and held a festival. And they went into the house of their God and ate and drank and reviled Abimelech. So we've talked about this before. Part of their demonic worship included alehouses or, uh, or taverns in which there was great drunkenness, sexual perversion, where Baal and Ashtoreth were put on display together. This is what we're seeing. They're going to, the, this, to their house. Is this what it says? They're, 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 to the house of their God. They're going to feast. They're going to eat. And while they're doing this in a drunken state, they're, uh, they're, they're trash talking. That's what's happening. That's what's happening. And, and, and Gaul, the son of a, uh, Ebed, said, who is Abimelech, and who are, who are we, sons of Shechem, that we should serve him? So he's like, who is the king? Forget the king, not my president, you know, that kind of thing. Drunken guys. Uh, he's not, is, he, is he not the son of uh, Jerubbabel? Again, no honor for Gideon. Gideon. And is not uh, Zebul his officer? Now he's making fun of his, his, his staff. And serve, sir, serve the men of, of Habor and father of Shechem, but why should we serve him? Would, would that this people be under my hand, that I would remove Abimelech? I would say to Abimelech, increase your army and come out. All right, and then verse 30. Then, then Zebul, the, the ruler of the city, heard the words of, words of Gaul. Gaul start, stirring up controversy, ready to betray Abimelech. The son of Abed, was, he, his anger was kindled. So now uh, Zebul, he, he's, he's upset. And the messengers, uh, and he sent messengers to Abimelech secretly, saying, Behold, Gaul, the son of Ebed, and his relatives have come to Shechem, and they're stirring up the city against you. Now, therefore, go by night, and the people who are with you set an ambush in the field. Then in the morning, as soon as the sun rises up, rise early and rush upon the city. And when the people and and when he and the people who are with him come out against you, do as your hand finds you to do. So they're getting ready for this 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 battle. Verse thirty four. So Abimelech and all the men who were with him rose up by night and set an ambush against Shechem in four companies. And Gaul the son of Ebed went out and stood at the entrance of the the city gate. And Abimelech the Abimelech and the people who were with him rose from the ambush. And Gaul saw the people and said to Zebul, Look, the people are coming down from the mountaintops. And Zebul said, You mistake the shadow of the mountain for men. So Zebul, right, he knows. He's the one who, who kind of he, he kind of uh, orchestrated this thing. He's the one who sent secretly to Abimelech and said, Hey, y'all come attack. So now this guy is, 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 is sitting there. He, uh, Zebul knows what Gaul uh, is saying is right. But he's trying to deceive him. Going, no, 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 that's just the shade. That's not a bunch of people coming down the mountain to kill you. That's just the shadows. Don't you look at the sun. Doesn't it look like shadows? And they're like, this is what he's doing, right? In verse 37, Gaul spoke again and said, Look, people are coming down from the center of the land, and one company is coming from the direction of the diviner's oak. And then Zephiel said to him, Where is your mouth now? Who said, Who is Abimelech? And we should serve him. Not, are not these people whom you despise? Go now and fight with them. So like he's, he's, to me, he's like this WWE commentator. He's trying to stir up controversy. He's like, you know, these guys are, uh, they're not coming to fight you now that they're here. Hey, we're, come on, shut up and go fight them. Mark, didn't you say you were so tough when we were drinking beers the other night? You were the tough guy. He's just stirring up controversy. And Gaul, and so Gaul does. He, he went out at the head of the, the leaders of Shechem and fought with Abimelech. And Abimelech chased him and he fled before him. And he fell wounded in the entrance at, up to the entrance of the gate. And Abimelech lived with, at, um, are, uh, 
Aryurma, and Zebul drove out Gaul and his relatives so that they could not dwell in Shechem. This is part of the fight. Abimelech has attacked the people. It's worked. Gaul has been drove, driven out. Uh, it's not over, though, because, right, he, he's now, there, he, it's still continuing. Now there's going to be a slaughtering. Verse 42. And on the coming day, the people went out to the field, and Abimelech was, was told, and he took his people and divided them into three companies and set an ambush in the field. And he looked and saw the people coming out of the city. So he rose against them and killed them. And Abimelech and the company that was with him rushed forward and stood at the entrance of the gate, while the two companies rushed uh, 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 upon all who were in the field and killed them. And Abimelech fought against the city that day, and he captured the city and killed the people who were in it. And he raised the city and sowed it with, uh, with salt. When all the leaders of the Tower of Shechem heard of it, they entered a stronghold of the house of uh, El Bereth. This is a demonic fortress. I want you to think, we're pause for a moment. Don't you think of the, uh, we're in San Antonio. The best way to look at this is, the, is like the Alamo. Not that the Alamo is a demonic fortress, but, but I want you to think of a fortress, a, 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 a mission post. Because this was, this was not just a military stronghold, but this was a, a fortified uh, uh, a building where they would all do military uh, plans, strategies, also worship their demonic gods. This was kind of a one-stop shop. This was a demonic fortress. Uh, and so they, they all gathered together kind of in their, their demon church because they're, they're being attacked on by the city. This was going to be a fortress that would protect them. So that's why they all went into this, the, the, the house of this demon god. And Abimelech was told, all the, leaders, uh, of the, uh, uh, all the leaders of the tower of Shechem have gathered together. And Abimelech went up to, the Mount, uh, to Mount Zeb, uh, Zalmon, and he and all the people who were with him. And Abimelech took an axe in his hand and cut down a bundle of uh, a brushwood and took it up and laid it on his shoulder. And he said to the men who were with him, what you have seen me do, hurry and do as I've done. So every one of the people cut down his bundle and following Abimelech and put it, on his, uh, put it against the, the stronghold and they set the stronghold on fire so that all the people in the tower of Shechem died, about 1,000 men and women. Everyone's trapped in the demon church. That's where they go during the war and they get burned. They get burned. He burns them all alive. This is horrible. This is horrific. But do you see the parable of the bramble start to play out, right? The bramble was going to rise up. It's going to be like a fire. It's going to destroy the people of Shechem. It's also going to destroy Abimelech. That's what we got to see next. Abimelech is going to be destroyed by, quote, a certain woman, a millstone, and a crushed skull. Here we go. Then Abimelech went to uh, Thebes and encamped against Thebes and captured it. But there was a strong tower, so another, another tower within the city, and all the men and women and all the leaders of the city fled and shut, it, it shut themselves in, just like before, right? And they went up to the roof of the tower, and Abimelech came to the tower to fight against it, and he, and he drew near towards the door uh, to, of the tower to burn it with fire, just like before, right? And a certain woman threw an upper millstone on Abimelech's head and crushed his skull. Like, the, you just are reading this whole thing, and you're like, man, this is getting, there's fire, there's war. Like, there's this, this it just feels like this buildup, and all of a sudden, boom, rock, head, done. Like, it, it just ends. It just ends there. Bimlex, done. And he's not totally done, but verse 54, then he called quickly to a young man, uh, his armor bearer, and said to him, uh, draw your sword and kill me, lest they, they say a woman killed him. And uh, his young man thrust, or it, and his young man thrust him through, and, di and he died. And the men of Israel saw that Abimelech had died, and everyone departed and went home. Like, okay, the, the war, all right, we're done. We're all good. We're no longer fighting. Yeah, we didn't really want to fight either. The guy's dead. Let's just go home. Like, just, this is a wild story. Like, they're burning people alive. They're fighting. And then Abimelech dies, and it's like, all right, we're good. Let's go home. Let's go home. Verse 56, here's why it all happened. Thus God returned the evil of Abimelech, which he committed against his father in killing his 70 brothers. And God also made all the evil of the men of Shechem return on their heads. Upon them came the curse of uh, uh, Jotham, the son of Jerubbabel, which is Gideon. So why did all this happen? All of this happened, this whole story, just read this whole you know, narrative to us. Why did it all happen? Well, because God was 
returning, uh, Abimelech's murderous, murderous, rea- uh, murderous actions uh, against him. He was judging him, and he was judging the, the Shechemites as well for their active role in their participation and their dishonoring not only of Gideon, but on, the, on, on murdering 70 men and conspiring to do so. This whole thing, this whole story is all about God's divine and righteous retribution, giving Abimelech and the Shechemites the, the judgment do their name. God honors the curse of Jotham in his fable when he, he spoke against the men of, of Abimelech and Shechem. What's interesting here is when he gives that, uh, that, that, that fable, they could have at that moment repented. You know what? That is us. We have dealt in bad faith. We have murdered 70 sons, and uh, we're wrong. We shouldn't do that. Uh, we actually don't want to be destroyed. God, forgive us. Let's repent. They don't do that. They don't do that, but they continue forward for three years before the evil spirit enters, right? We, we think that, oh, the evil spirit conspired, and he, he, that was the problem. No, the problem was they were already hell-bent on their own destruction. God intervenes and, and uses the evil that's going on to work out his divine justice and judgment upon the people. This is what we call righteous retribution. Righteous retribution. This entire story is about that, this righteous retribution. See, all the stories in Judges, and this is important for us to see, all the stories in the book of Judges are about God saving his people. And be this, it, it's, he's saving people who don't deserve it either. Every story, when God jumps in and saves his people through various judges, he saves them and they don't deserve it evil either. Why? Because they have also done evil. We see the refrain continually throughout the book of Judges is that they again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and then God delivers them, right? See, so far through the book of Judges, all we have seen is God mercy, God's mercy and grace on display. We've seen it time and time again that God saves sinners. Here with Abimelech, we see that, that God does not have grace towards Abimelech, but actually gives the sinner, Abimelech, and, and the Shechemites what they actually deserve. That's what we have to understand. God is not, you don't go to the slide yet, but my next point is going to be this, but I'm going to say it early. Uh, God's not obligated to show us mercy and grace. We don't have to go there yet, but I, 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 he's not obligated to. It's important for us to see this. This is what mercy and grace m- mean. If he was obligated, it wouldn't be mercy and grace. Mercy is, is receiving something you don't deserve. Grace is withholding something you do deserve. So he des- they deserve punishment. They receive punishment. That's not, that, that is justice. That's what justice is. Mercy is, is receiving something positive in, in a time in which you did not receive, you, you didn't deserve anything positive. So God has continually throughout the book of Judges lavished his mercy and grace on his people. Hear what we see. Is this divine judgment of God, this retribution on God, uh, on, on his people by God. It's very important for us to see because I, I believe Christians oftentimes, oftentimes take God's mercy and grace for granted. We assume that we deserve it. We assume we deserve God's mercy and grace. We, 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 we assume we do. We do not deserve. What we deserve is punishment. What we deserve is God's righteous retribution. We deserve, like Abimelech, his, his, God's destruction. Abimelech incites the leaders to conspire against Gideon, right? I want you to see this, how, how, the, how this divine righteous retribution plays out. While Abimelech, he's going to get exactly what he, what he dished out, he's going to receive back. Abimelech incites the leaders of, of Shechem to oppose and conspire against Gideon, right? Then what happens in return, then Gaul conspires against Abimelech with the leaders of Shechem. So we see, we see this, this play out again with uh, he sets an ambush to devour and destroy the sons of Gideon. They set an ambush against him. Abimelech kills his brothers with a stone, and he is then killed with a stone. What we see that the, the parallelism throughout this entire story is, is to, to show us and remind us not that karma exists, but that God is clearly involved and his hand is active in, in, in the punishment of his people. 
See, he's not a father who's distant, but he's very involved. He doesn't leave the punishment to someone else, but God punishes his own children himself. And this should be a sobering reality because God is not obligated to save sinners. We'll, we'll, we can go to that slide. We'll talk about that next. Does he, though? He does. He, he's not obligated to save sinners. He, he does, though. He's not obligated, though. We've got to see this. He is merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. God is gracious. We are recipients of that. The cross of Jesus Christ is proof that God has mercy and grace towards sinners. But I want you to see he's not obligated to that. He's not obligated to save sinners, to show grace to sinners. We must remember that salvation is not something we deserve. What we are witnessing with Abimelech is what it looks like when we, to, what it looks like to be opposed by God. Abimelech is opposing God. Uh, sorry, God is opposing Abimelech. And this is what it looks like when, when Abimelech opposes God. When we oppose God, we, when we are against God, what we see is he simply here, he hands uh, Abimelech over to his own destruction. We see this in Romans 1, we see that the wrath of God is revealed uh, against ungodliness, that we suppress the truth, and God hands us over to our own self-destruction. I need us to see this, church. We are all like Abimelech. Some way, shape, or form. It may not be anger, it may not be aggression, it may not be uh, uh, selfish ambition, it may not be desire for power. But when all of us in some way, shape, or form are hell-bent on our own destruction unless Jesus steps in. We see this time and time again throughout Judges. Unless God steps in, there's no trajectory change. What we just see in this one scene, in this one chapter, is that this is what it would look like if God didn't step in and save his people. And so if Jesus doesn't step in, we are helpless. We don't deserve salvation. We, don't, we deserve divine retribution. But what we get through Jesus is divine intervention. Jesus shows up. He steps in. He steps in. And apart from the mercy and grace of God, all men and all women, we would, be, we would destroy ourselves. So what I want to do with the remainder of our time is I want to look at one passage in the New Testament that I think solidifies this completely for us. And that's Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. It says this, And you were dead in your trespasses and sin. Dead. This is the language the Bible uses to describe us. We were dead in our trespasses and sin, in which you once walked, meaning you no longer walk, but you once did, following the course of this world, following the prince of the air, of this, the spirit that is at work in the sons of disobedience. So just like there was a spirit at work in the heart uh, 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 of the disobedient Abimelech, we all also used to walk according to the, the, the spirit that's still alive working in the sons of disobedience. Verse 3, among whom we all once lived, so all, all mankind in its passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were, quote, by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. This is it. I want you to see Abimelech. This is, we are him. This is us. We are, we are, we are hell-bent on our own destruction. We're, we're, we're dead in our sin. We used to walk according to the ways of the world. We used to follow a spirit that's not the Holy Spirit. We were disobedient sons and daughters of God. And we are by nature children of wrath. Not deserving of mercy, not deserving of, 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 of grace, but deserving of what were we deserving of? Divine retribution. But verse 4, but God. This is the key. God loves us. God cares for us. Though we are hell-bent on our own destruction, though we are deceived, though we are disobedient, though we follow the patterns of the prince of the air of the, this world, though we are uh, 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 children by nature and choice, sinners and, 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 and children of wrath, God, but God, being rich in mercy, because God has so much mercy. And because of the great love in which he loves us. These are the two awesome things we have to see here. God is merciful and he loves us. 
He's merciful and he loves us. So though we don't deserve his mercy and we don't deserve his love, it's not obligated for him to give it, but he loves us. If you're a parent and you have a child, there's times where you're like, they don't deserve this, but like, I, I love them. I want to help them. I, I, I kind of want to give them the candy, even though I told them I'm not going to give them the candy. You're like, ah, oh, I'm stuck here. I want you to see God is, is so much more merciful than you, so much more rich in grace than you. And because of the love in which he loved us, even, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. There's no way to be saved apart from the mercy and grace of God. And raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ. See, we don't deserve to experience as the children of God continual mercy and grace and kindness. We don't deserve it, but it is given to us. We see in verse 7, in the coming ages, he's going to keep showing us mercy and grace. You and I experience the mercy and grace of Jesus every single day, and it's continuing. But it's not an obligation. It's because of his divine love, his intervention, that he came, that he showed his grace to us. That's what it says in verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of your own doing. It is a gift of God. And it's not a result of works so that no one can boast. So you didn't earn it. You can't work to keep it. Salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ alone. It's an act of God. It's grace. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. But we can receive it. We can hold on to it. We can experience it. It can be ours through faith in Jesus Christ alone. This is great news. This is great news. That though we, like Abimelech, deserve the righteous retribution from God through faith in Jesus Christ can receive mercy, grace, salvation. We can see, receive cleansing, forgiveness, righteousness through faith. And it's through faith alone. We are saved by grace through faith. Nothing we did, nothing we can do. It's a gift of God. So that we can't boast in pride and arrogance we must just worship, thankfully, that God saw us in love. Though we were running from him, he ran after us to save us, adopt us, redeem us through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so what, what that salvation it accomplished something. It accomplishes our cleansing. So like we are, we are, we, though dirty, we're now clean. It accomplishes our forgiveness. Though we had a great debt, it has now been cleared. But it does something even greater than just cleaning us and forgiving us. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the grace and mercy of God, what it does, it it gives us righteousness. Gives us righteousness. We don't deserve righteousness because we are are by nature children of wrath, sinners, hell-bent on our own destruction. We have nothing to bring to the table but but the sin that that crucified our Savior. And with this righteousness, what, what we are now declared righteous through faith in Jesus Christ. It's important for us to also note this. We're also given righteousness. So, right, if you've been cleansed and forgiven, your account goes from uh, negative $1 billion, right, and you're in debt, and you go to zero, okay, debt's clear, right? But you're still not righteous, right? You're just equal. You're just like, I'm not, I'm not holy, but I'm not, like, unholy. Like, I'm just, I'm at neutral, right? And so what God doesn't do, doesn't just forgive us, and cleanse us, and, and, and clear out our account, but he, he, he then declares us righteous. But he doesn't do so arbitrarily, to where you look at the account. Well, he said, this account says righteous, but it's not. Like, we don't identify as righteous, ladies and gentlemen. We're not, we don't, because, you know, our world today, you kind of feel that. Like, I'm righteous, but no, I feel like a fake, a phony. Like, I still sin. Any of you ever feel that way? Like, I'm very aware of my sin. I'm very aware of it. Like to, to call me righteous seems kind of hypocritical. And ever, Christian ever felt that way? Well, it would be hypocritical if all Jesus did was say is, I'm going to call you righteous. I'm going to give you a new, you know, you know, title. You get to be declared righteous. You're not really righteous, but we're just going to call you that. And everyone's got to call you that. That's not what he does. 
he declares us righteous, and then he gives us righteousness. So it's legit. You look at the account, and it's, it's full righteousness. It's Jesus Christ's righteousness given to us, his sinners. Not only did we not deserve being forgiven, not only did we not deserve being cleansed, did not only did we not deserve being called adopted, righteous sons and daughters of God, but we've now been given perfection. All of Christ's righteousness was actually given to us. God doesn't, I need you to see this. God doesn't just look at, our, look at us and go, oh, I see Jesus. That's not really them. I see Jesus. He looks at you and sees you in your humanity and sees righteous. Based on whose who's, who's authority and whose account? Christ's righteousness given to you. I'm in with this. 2 Corinthians 5 tells us this, that Jesus Christ was made sin. He who knew no sin was made to become sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. This is not metaphorical. This is actual. Jesus doesn't metaphorically die for our sins. He actually dies for our sins. He actually dies for them. Our past, our present, our future sins. We saw last week that even the Apostle Paul said he was the, the chief of sinners, right? He killed persecuted Christians. There's no sin that Jesus could not have died for. Jesus was made to be sin so that we could become righteous, actually righteous, tangibly. When Jesus' righteousness has been given to us, condemned sinners through faith in him alone. We are cleansed. We are forgiven. We're adopted sons and daughters. We are declared righteous. If you check the account, the account, it's proof that the righteousness is there. Jesus has handed you his righteousness. It's a gift that can only be received through faith. Not by your own doing. It's not your own works. It's a gift from God. So may we not boast. May we understand that we do not deserve this great mercy and grace. But marvel and rejoice in the goodness and kindness and the love that God has for us that though we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let's pray.